When you start getting documentaries, it's over. It's over. What it once was is no longer. It's just done. They moved on, probably changed facilities, and now the information will come out. That's how I feel. That's how I want to feel. Most of the time, that's how things are, right? A few anomalies sprinkled in here and there, but for the most part, it's usually a sign that it's over. So this is the Area 51 documentary. Let's check it out. In 1989, a man called Bob Lazar walked into a Las Vegas TV station and gave a remarkable interview. He said that he'd worked out in the Nevada desert at a top secret facility known as Area 51. He said he worked on a highly classified project, reverse engineering recovered alien spacecraft. This story was a worldwide sensation. And Area 51 became a household name, synonymous with UFOs, secret projects, and little green men. And yet, neither the US government nor its military have ever denied his claims, and they still don't officially confirm that Area 51 exists, despite satellite photos proving it does. Many dismiss Bob Lazar as a fantasist, and yet others see him as a whistleblower, exposing a government cover-up of UFOs and alien contact. I am convinced based on my research and the individuals whom I've had contact in the U.S. intelligence community that the U.S. government does indeed have uh, craft that meet the description of many of the UFO reports. Oh! Doesn't that sound familiar? Hmm. Here's another person going on record saying based upon the ones I've spoke to and they're not talking about just the everyday regular Joe Schmo like me and you. No, they're talking about people with these high level clearances that have access. And he says it again. They have it. I had that stuff. <laughs> personal opinion, uh, based on comments I've gotten from uh, the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at CIA, would seem to indicate that Bob was perhaps an unwitting participant in a program designed to introduce someone with a technical background to some elements of the UFO research projects going on out at the test site. I have no doubts that Lazar actually was in a place where top secret investigations were going on. I'm not sure about all the details that have emerged from his account, but he certainly gives me the impression that he was actually there. Do I believe Bob Lazar? My answer to that is yes. In Hex going, is going on uh, eight years that I've known him, his story has never changed. He wasn't in it for the publicity. He wasn't, surely wasn't in it for the money. He lost everything he had. Uh, I believe he's since, since, totally sincere. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They, they left that little nugget of information out, that little tidbit of information out. I didn't know he lost everything. See, this is what I was talking about with those guys, David Grush and them. How, how they're putting so much on the line by speaking out. But this even takes it for losing everything. Everything. That's got to say something to y'all. As far as I can tell, he's a bright guy who tells a great tale. 
and who's told it often to people who have not checked on him to accept the notion that, well, the government wiped his slate clean. Basically, I think uh, he had an experience. I think uh, he saw some things that shocked him, was subject to some conditions and experiences that were very unnerving to him and very profound. He said, you would love to see what's, what's out there because it's like beyond science fiction. He said, and I wish I could talk to you about it, but I can't. And that's as close as he ever got to telling me anything that happened out there. You'll find many people who have seen these discs. Question is, where do they come from? Uh, Bob Lazar may be one of the few people who can tell us that they're from somewhere else. I've no doubt that there's a relatively small number of people within the intelligence, military intelligence and scientific and technical intelligence community who are aware of what's going on and an even smaller group who are actually organizing top secret research into this phenomenon. There's been an operating airbase out at the location known as Area 51 since the 1950s, when it was home to the CIA's top secret SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. Then in the 1970s, it became the test flight center for the F-117 stealth fighter and the B-2 stealth bomber. It's fairly public knowledge that we have a super secret facility uh, in the mountains uh, of northern Nevada, uh, referred to as Grim Lake, uh, Area 51 of the uh, Nellis uh, Air Force Base test range. Uh, it's also been uh, referred to as, uh, as Dreamland. This is an area that has been known but officially denied for many decades. All of our super secret aircraft uh, have been developed and test flown out in this particular area. So it only makes sense that if you have something as sophisticated as a flying saucer and the related technology to that, then that would certainly be one of the prime locations you'd want to go. What you see is an ordinary looking Air Force base. It's, it's nothing to write home about, but because the government won't talk about it, everyone wants to see it. We don't believe in ordinary, Glenn. <laughs> we don't believe in that, Glenn. We believe in extraordinary. We don't believe in ordinary, Glenn. The military has never said there are no UFOs. It's never directly denied any of the Area 51 stories. It would have been so simple when these claims came out, these Papoose Lake claims, for the military to simply say, Look, we have nothing there. They could take a few reporters to this area and show them nothing there. The military hasn't done it. The military has stonewalled. It has remained silent. And that's the most damning thing that they can do. Area 51 to this day is not acknowledged. That is to say, the Air Force does not admit that it exists. This status has been maintained very carefully, particularly in the last few years. The puzzle is that the base has clearly been very active for quite a while, and you can see that there are about um, 700 to 1,000 people traveling from Las Vegas every day. So essentially the bulk of what has gone on there in the last 10 years um, has not emerged from the black. This airplane was, the program was terminated. The airplanes were put in mothballs for 20 years before they admitted the existence of the aircraft. There's programs that they're working on today that are 50 years ahead of anything that you and I can even conceive of, and that we may never, that may never see the light of day. Would you say it's America's most top secret military base? As far as, a, as, far as an operational test facility, it's probably the most secret test facility in the free world, yes. So there is no question that the facility is there, that the government has said very little in the past about it. 
Now, the real question, I suppose, is are there any flying saucers out there? No one had associated flying saucers with Area 51 until Bob Lazar's interview hit television screens around the world. He said that he worked at an underground facility called S4. The top secret project was codenamed Galileo. They would call it a specific time. For instance, the operator would say, Mr. Lazar, it's now 4.15 a.m. We expect you to be at McCarran Airport at 4.45. Your plane will be leaving at such and such time. I drive there, check in, board the plane, and the plane would fly out to Groom Lake. It would land there. I'd get off the plane and wait, and there would be a bus to take me and whoever else is going to uh, S4, Papoose Lake, which is about 15 miles south of there. And uh, then I would check in at S4. Tell me about how you felt on your very first trip out. The first trip out there it was uh, it was actually very exciting because it seemed so cloak and dagger to me, especially after I got in the bus with the blacked out windows. I, I kind of thought that was neat. Uh, drove out to the site and then uh, it was checked in, guards walking around with guns and uh, I, I was sure what I was working on was going to be pretty fascinating. Entering a bus with blacked out windows and you thinking it's pretty cool and neat, it's insane to me. That's just, that's, that gives a lot of insight to you, Bob Lazar. That lets me know a lot about you, bro. No, I would be very like weirded out, like apprehensive. Like, are you, we're on a bus and the windows are blacked out and I have no idea what I'm about to encounter? Nah, nah, bro. I seen how this movie ends. No, thank you. He says that within a few days of working out at S4, he was shown an actual flying disc in one of the hangars. When I was brought in by bus, and for the first time, one of the hangar doors, the one on the end, was open. The bus drove up and we stopped there and a clear as day in the hangar, taking up almost all the hangar, was the disc. Uh, looked like something right out of a science fiction movie. And as I walked in there, I thought, well, this is the new advanced aircraft we've been working on, and this is why people keep seeing flying saucers, because it's ours, and we've just been testing it probably for all these years. And what, what color and size was it? It was a uh, dull stainless steel, pewter gray, very uh, unimpressive color-wise. About 52.8 feet in diameter and about 16 feet high. So was it actually a recovered craft that you were working on, or was it one that um, scientists had built as a mock-up of, of a recovered craft? Well, whether it was recovered, given or what, it was not built as a mock-up. It, it was an alien craft built on another world. There was absolutely no doubt about that. The Tsar claims that he was one of only 22 people who had something called majestic clearance to work on the craft itself. The whole aim of the project was to take these craft, or the one in particular that I was working on, and try and duplicate its systems and subsystems with earthly materials. The work that I did basically entailed back engineering the power and propulsion system. And I opted to start with the, uh, the power, the, the reactor that, that ran the craft. I knew immediately if his credentials could be verified, if even part of his story could be verified, it'd be one tremendous expose. George Knapp was a long-standing TV reporter. He'd heard enough of the UFO rumors over the years 
to appreciate how big a scoop this could be if Lazar was telling the truth. He gave me uh, uh, information about his background, educational background and employment background. I started with, uh, with his claim to have worked at Los Alamos Lab. We went to Los Alamos and uh, got nothing uh, even close to cooperation. Uh, they wouldn't uh, respond to our phone calls. They say we have no information on Bob Lazar. There's nothing in the files. I said, are you sure now? No, nothing in the files. I showed them uh, the, the phone book entry that Bob had kept that said uh, he was there. I showed them the newspaper article that, that showed that he was there. Basically, uh, Los Alamos Lab um, tried to thwart me at every step were completely uncooperative in trying to get information about Bob, and I, and I found that to be the case at every step of the way in trying to verify his background. It's like you gotta figure out who's in the shadows pulling the strings and puppeting everyone and going behind the strings. You see it on shows. There's always this, this person in the background you don't see, could be working for the CIA, you never know, and, and they show up and and ask you to do this job for their country, for your country, whether it's erasing someone's history here or, or doing some back channel, whatever. That's what this feels like they, they started to do. It's like almost like they're 10 steps ahead. And they're like, if he does this or if he starts to speak out, we'll have this contingency in place, this contingency in place. And it'll look like he never existed and then it'll also look like he's one of the biggest liars. We'll, we'll just destroy his ca character and make, put it so much into question that no one will ever believe what he's saying. Thursday, 12.37 p.m. Former NASA mission specialist Bob Exler had heard about Area 51 and Groom Lake when he worked on the Apollo and Space Shuttle projects. He was intrigued by Lazar's claims and started to investigate. Or use his name. Uh, uh, I did uh, a variety of research uh, relative to Bob Lazar. I actually met him. Uh, I obtained a copy of his, uh, what they call a W-2 form, which is one of the um, uh, IRS documents associated with, uh, with pay. Uh, his particular form indicated that he worked for the U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence. Um, they informed me that it was a genuine document. It was not something that had been fabricated. There were a variety of numbers, uh, contract numbers and so forth, uh, issued on the document, which I was able to research, again, finding that uh, these were uh, highly classified uh, numbers. In fact, uh, Internal Revenue Service ran into a, a brick wall when it came to trying to track down uh, the actual employer uh, associated with the, with the document. And then again, with the Social Security Administration, we found that Bob Lazar's records had in fact been, been bleached clean. There was nothing there in spite of the fact that the document uh, clearly indicated that uh, Social Security taxes had been taken out of his pay. everyone whose research Bob Lazar believes his claims. Stanton Friedman is one of the most respected authors in the UFO field today. He's a former nuclear physicist with top secret clearance and has many friends and contacts in the Black Project world. I've looked at considerable depth into Bob Lazar's claims both about himself and about propulsion system. Those are fairly elaborate claims. I've talked to the schools that he claims to have received degrees from. I've checked on his high school record. I talked to Los Alamos lab where he was supposedly a scientist and so forth. I have come up totally empty. Now when a guy lies like that, you get very wary. And you know, it has all the trimmings, his story, of a Walter Mitty story. Somebody in his imagination was you know stronger brighter faster than anybody else i don't doubt that he did some work at los alamos and other places he's clever he drives a jet powered car fixes radiation detectors so he may have performed some service but i can find no reason to think that he worked out there on a flying saucer 
I mean, I had to wonder whether this guy was making this stuff up, but then I see the phone book and I see the newspaper article and I talk to people who work with Bob at the lab and who said, in fact, that he did work on classified projects, yet no one can find any records of his background. The people that I worked with, colleagues, the people I went to school with, obviously knew I was there, and the people at Los Alamos, I was friends with and people that worked under me and alongside of me, knew I was there and, you know, cooperate was going on, but, um, you know, officially, it's very difficult to get information for the people in charge. To further prove his claims, Lazar agreed to take a polygraph test, which he passed. The thing that uh, is interesting about polygraph is that I if you're embellishing or if you don't completely believe what you're saying, it is very, very easy to detect. Uh, all it really will tell you is that the individual believes with 100% conviction that what he's reporting is exactly as he recalls and as he believes it to be. And that clearly was the case with Bob Lazar. Now, could his perception have been... A, a bit askew? Yes, that's possible. But he clearly wasn't lying. I think Bob is even open to the possibility that perhaps he had been used in some sort of misinformation or disinformation campaign. I mean, look at him. He has a pirate flag floating on his house. He races jet cars. He likes uh, fast women. He likes guns. Um, he w he's technically capable. So in that sense, he may be perfect for this kind of a program. Technically capable, scientifically knowledgeable, and yet uh, completely discreditable at a, at a moment's notice. If you wanted to uh, test public reaction to a story about Area 51 and then suddenly discredit it afterwards, Bob may have been the most qualified person in the country. Lazar says that on one occasion he was escorted into the flying disc that he saw in the hangar to analyze its propulsion system. It was obviously made uh, to be piloted by something smaller than the average human being. Uh, very cramped in there. Um, what were the size of these seats that were in there? The seats were very small. I'd say about one-third to one-fourth the size of a normal human seat. A lot of people a lot of people say, boy, it must have been exciting to go in there, and I, and I always say it, it wasn't. It was a very ominous feeling. It, um, I know it sounds silly, but it, it, it's so unearthly in there. You have spoken to someone who's actually seen um, a UFO under a tarpaulin at Area 51. I have. Uh, I've, I've spoken to several people who've seen UFOs or disc-shaped craft out there. There was, a, there was a woman who was a secretary for a major defense contractor at the Nevada test site who worked on nuclear programs who told me that she had sat in on, on uh, conversations between military and civilian contractors at which the Roswell case had been discussed, at which it had been discussed taking some Roswell material to Area 51. Uh, the level of secrecy during those meetings was great. Afterward, they'd take the, the ribbons out of the typewriters she was typing on. She was ready to tell me about this, and I had this conversation with her on the phone. The next day after this conversation takes place, she's visited by two men who say that they work for the company she used to work for, reminding her that she is still under a security oath, told her, we know that you do a lot of traveling back and forth, a lot of long drives between Las Vegas and L.A. We'd hate for something to happen to you or your family. No interview. I mean, it happened again and again and again. Same scenario. Lazar says that in addition to being shown inside the disc, he actually saw it take off from the lake bed. I was brought into the hangar for one of the short duration tests and the craft was already outside on the lake bed and that was uh, pretty much of a marvelous sight so the huge thing it died. it's like seeing a house lift off the ground you, you can't imagine the energy involved to do that because of the uh, extremely high energy output and the fact that the outside of the craft does is used as a conductor that does ionize the air
and the crafts do, as a byproduct of this, glow at night, uh, much like a fluorescent tube will light up. So, you know, bright, strange jumping lights in the sky, that, that does explain that. Would you categorically say there is no way that, that humans could have built the craft that you saw? Absolutely. I will categorically deny <laughs> that, well, I don't know, how exactly should I put that? I guess I can just say it straight out. There is, there is no way that any government on this earth could produce that craft, period. And I defy anyone to argue that point. That is scary. At the same time, you're able to understand why they're trying to keep it from everybody. Although we don't like it, that gives them the biggest advantage. If, if they're able to reverse engineer it and, and, or the one they have that they recovered able to repair and get it up and going and train somebody or get somebody who's capable to fly it. That gives them such a huge advantage. Doesn't make it right, but you kind of understand what they're doing or trying to attempt to do. One of the big questions that's hung over this whole story is whether Lazar saw a man-made flying disc and not an alien spacecraft. A lot of these craft which are being developed in secrecy in, in the United States are tested at night. And one can imagine that seen through kind of half-closed eyes, something like an F-117 stealth fighter or a B-2 bomber, side-on or front-on, would look remarkably like, say, a flying saucer or a UFO. You see an F-117, or you see tacit blue, um, or you see uh, a B-2. Particularly if you see it from some fairly unusual angle, you're going to have a very hard time relating that to conventional aircraft. Um, some of these things can look very strange indeed. Um, so, you know, an unusual but decidedly terrestrial aircraft um, can certainly present the appearance of a disc from many angles. I think for anyone who's, who's been out into the Western United States and seen the kind of place it is and let their imaginations run riot a bit, it is possible to imagine in, its, in these vast test areas technologies which are highly exotic, highly uh, revolutionary and would change the way we feel about science today. However, to say that that is alien science derived from beyond this world, I think is something which is just, it is unbelievable. It's too much to, uh, to absorb. Do you think that some of the truth certainly lies out there in the middle of the Nevada desert at Groom Lake? I would expect that some of the truth may very well lie out in the desert near Groom Lake. It's the right place for some of it to be. It's isolated, it's under control, it's high security. I don't think we've yet scratched the surface on what's happening out there with regard to flying saucers.
According to Lazar, the craft that they were secretly testing out in the desert at night used an exotic anti-gravity propulsion system. The reactor itself was an incredibly advanced system. This is, uh, was an antimatter reactor. This is something we could only dream of having, something that could without huge amounts of power that rivals several nuclear power plants running at capacity. What happens is a great gravity distortion is created, and you're essentially bending space toward the craft. The craft becomes part of that space, and then when the reactors, or when the gravity amplifiers are shut down, the craft is essentially where it was focused. It's a very difficult thing to grasp. It happens virtually instantaneously because of the fact that gravity distorts time. And if you're bending space and time along with it, when you wind back up in that place, you're there between the ticks of the clock. Looking at uh, nighttime video films out in the uh, uh, test site area, we've seen video of craft that were uh, luminous that would move across the sky as if it was uh, skipping a stone across water or, or sort of a sewing machine effect. What we see across the screen are a series of uh, lights, of dashes of light uh, as the object moves from point A to point B. Therefore, we are seeing uh, what you might call a shadow effect of the propulsion mechanism at work. Bob Lazar is not the only person who's come forward and claimed to have worked out at the base on flying disks. Former U.S. Marines test pilot Bill Uhouse worked out at Groom Lake and other top secret locations for more than 40 years, working for the Pentagon and civilian contractors on a variety of highly classified projects, including, he says, a flying disc recovered from a crash in Kingman, Arizona in May 1953. He said that he'd been cleared to do this interview and to discuss certain information but asked us not to show his face. What were you actually working on out there? One of the things I worked on was a, a flying disc simulator. It was designed in New Mexico by a, a separate staff that uh, built it uh, in parallel with the actual craft that they were had intended to fly. The purpose of the simulator was to train pilots to, uh, to fly this strange, uh, strange looking craft. The simulator was a 10 meter round uh, disc. The skin was made of uh, boron uh, composite material. Not unlike uh, that you see on the F-117. How did you know how to build the simulator? There essentially there weren't any plans. The plans were generated as we constructed it. And it was a, it was a process there that, that took quite a while for, for us to even understand the concept way back in the 50s. Uhaus says that Lazar did work at Area 51. I think Bob is saying exactly what he knows and I know a little bit about Bob uh, from a different standpoint than a lot of the people know and what's been written about him, but uh, uh, Bob Lazar is not lying as far as... Uh so think about it, right? Let's just say Bob's lying. Right? He's lying. Let's just say he's lying. And we find it out. What does that change? Nothing, right? We go on with our day. Everything goes on as planned. We continue on with life. On to the next thing. But let's say if he's telling the truth. Everything changes. That's why this is important. That's why we must keep trying to figure out. We must 
know the truth. Was it a, a hard secret to keep? It was a vir virtually impossible secret to keep, but I did play by the rules, and uh, it caused a lot of problems. It caused some problems in my family life. Uh, I mean, imagine being married at the time, and uh, you know, you get a call, you know, perhaps at night, and. Uh, a strange voice on the phone, okay, you disappear, you can't tell your wife who it was on the phone, where you're going, and you come back, you know, sometime early in the morning. I mean, what is she going to think? Unaware of where he was going every day and being absent from home for long periods, Bob's relationship with his wife had deteriorated badly. This was seen as a potential security risk out at the base. My wife was having an affair with someone else, so they viewed that as a potential emotional instability and they no longer wanted me coming out until things were cleared up, either for it, you know, it, it to break up or heal or whatever, but they, uh, that's what put the brakes on everything there. And did they then stop calling you? Did you get very frustrated about that? Yeah, then I began to wonder, boy, now they've given me all this information and everything's come to a dead stop, what's going on? And uh, that's when I began to be concerned, and then uh, that's when I began said, you know, it's, now it's becoming important that some other people know what was going on. As the silence turned from days to weeks, he finally decided to tell his wife and closest friends just what he'd been doing. Were you aware of the security implications? I was quite aware of what could happen, but I was also aware that uh, these guys would go to any extent to keep their secret and certainly not have someone that was on the inside running around. And uh, I didn't think it was beyond them at all to make me disappear, whether, it, I mean, who knows? I know it sounds more like a movie, but uh, uh, I didn't think it was beyond their capability to, to kill me, just to stop the, uh, the word from getting out. Do you blame Bob at this point? They have their contingency plan they got theirs i need to have mine i need to have mine pull my closest loved ones in my family that i trust and tell them hey you don't hear from me at a certain uh, amount of time and you need to call the police this is what i'm doing this is what i do this is what i'm working on you is it's, it's it's a no-brainer at that you have to because you just heard him say, I believe that they'll stop at nothing or go to the full extent of taking me out. Like, no, I, I don't blame him at all. Bob knew the test flight schedule for the discs and took his wife, his best friend, Jean Huff, and another friend, John Lear, out to the desert near the base on a Wednesday night in March, 1989. Started coming in too. Now, how far away can that thing pick up stuff uh, if it's like overhead, like up in the air? Overhead, 300 miles. Uh, geez. So it could be any one of these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds military to me. Yeah, yeah. I bet you that's you that's what this know. is. We got. Oh. You see that? Whoa. Yeah. What was that? Did you see that light just come on over yeah, there? That just I was looking was, right at it. Yeah. Saw it hey, let me like, check it out. Oh, was a shooting star. Right well. above it was a meteor too. No, there's a steady light. No, it's a steady it's light that just came on. Any kind of, uh... No, this one right over the range here. It oh. wasn't there, and then I was looking right yeah. there, and it blinked okay, on. It's very bright. That's brighter than a star. Yeah. Huh, yeah, no, doesn't look no, like no. landing lights. We got the light clear now, sir. We figured out what the Interesting. Okay, just change course. Oh. White light? Yeah. Yeah, he's coming at us. What did you see when you were out there? Shortly after the flight time that I had recorded, um, uh, white light 
came up, well, not a white light, it was actually more of an amber light, uh, came up off the ground and hovered, and then be do uh, began doing radical step maneuvers and darting from one side of the sky to the other, doing, doing some impossible flight characteristics. Do you think what you saw over the desert that night was an alien spacecraft? Could I identify it as an ET craft without Bob's help? No, it would have been a, and you know, like I said, an elliptically shaped saucer doing, you know, uh, just doing moves that we're not capable of, but I could not say that no, this wasn't some advanced Earth technology. I guess I'm not clear now where we figured out what the problem is, and whatever that heading is, we're ready for it. That would be a UFO. It's not blinking, it's not conforming to any sort of FAA lighting regulations. And there you're looking at it. That's like a typical UFO. If it was red, it would be real typical because that's what most people report, is red lights like that that are solid color. I don't think that's landing lights because it's curved already and we're still looking at it. Looks like he's curving back. Here he comes. That is a typical military UFO. There you go. This small group went back to see two more Wednesday night flight tests, but on the third trip, they were spotted, caught, and arrested. Bob was taken to Indian Springs Air Force Base and interrogated. That interrogation was about as intense as you can possibly get right stopping short of shooting me in the head. What were they saying to you? Everything up to and including that, you know, we can absolutely kill you right now and there'd be no one looking for you at all. And I mean, they, they, uh, everything. They threatened my wife. They threatened to kill my wife. They, they stopped. They said they'd stop at nothing. They said they thought they made that very clear. They couldn't believe that I had taken anyone out there to show them that, much less left with information like the uh, flight test data and uh, wanted to know what else I had said, who else I had told specifically. They were, uh, they were crazy. They really were. They were completely out of control. That's the part about Bob that throws me off. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't mind him or knock him for telling people. I, you know what I mean? I was almost mad that it took, him, took so long for him to do so. But taking them out there, that was a huge risk. Like... You, you should have known you would be caught, bro. They'd be on it out there, quickly. After this interrogation at Indian Springs Air Force Base, Bob says that he was put under constant surveillance by security personnel. His phones were tapped, his movements were monitored, and he often found his car followed by military helicopters. Worried about what might happen to him and angry about how he was being treated, he decided to hit back and approached a local TV station about an interview. I thought if I did an interview in silhouette, it would be kind of pushing back a bit. Uh, where I say, you guys stop and not saying too much, but just saying enough just to, to let them know that I'm pushing back a bit and then lay off or you know, it's going to get worse. It was really the only thing I could do. Did you get any calls from the military or from former workers to say, what the hell are you doing? Right after the interview aired, Dennis Mariani, who was my supervisor, called and you know, all he said was, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? And that was the end of the phone call. Um, that was the last, well, really second to last communication I had with him. and. Um, you know, then I decided, well, you know, that's it. And uh, really just said everything that I had seen and done and just wanted to divorce the entire situation.
Even now, more than 20 years later, the jury is still out on Bob Lazar and his claims about his work out at Groom Lake. It's a fascinating story which he's stuck to for more than two decades. And although many dismiss it as pure fantasy, the fact is that some of his credentials did check out. In addition, his former employers and even the tax authorities were caught covering up and refusing to release information on him. Why would they do that unless there was something to hide? One thing is for certain, if he is telling the truth, then we're all in for some shocking revelations in the decades to come. Is the government ever going to say, you know, we've been lying to you for 40 or 50 years? Not a chance. I believe they'd stage an event that is much more like what they do. They'll take a big cargo plane or C-130 or something, take one of the old disks that they've, uh, you know, analyzed time and time again or and finished with, go up to a high altitude and push it out the back and then go fly away and say, oh, look, the first disk has crashed. You know, here's a flying saucer. I mean, I, I can almost guarantee that's, that's the route they'd take. Certainly there are a lot of questions about Bob's background that have not been satisfactorily answered. But there's too much that Bob knows, I think, that couldn't be explained any other way. Uh, he knows about the layout of the base. Um, he know, knew about people who were involved in security checks. He knew when and where the test flights were going to take place because he took people out there three weeks in a row and they videotaped the tests. How did he know this stuff if he, in fact, did not have some kind of inside knowledge? Do you think he'd make a good uh, conduit of information? I mean, essentially a patsy. Yes, I do. I think it's quite likely that Lazar was set up perhaps to knowing that he would give out this disinformation. It's likely to be a very long time before we discover uh, what is actually being done out of Groom Lake now. They seem to wait anything from 15 to 20 years or more uh, after something has been retired before they acknowledge its existence. This airplane was built, designed, almost 40 years ago. 40 years before that, the hottest thing flying was a Seversky P-35. 40 years before that, it was a balloon. So the technology, technology has not stood still. So it's a very good possibility that we are looking at man-made transportation for the 21st century. Uh, it's, it's been so hopelessly polluted that I, I'm not sure we'll ever, we will ever get to the bottom of this story, and, and that's sad. I suspect that whatever was out there, discs, alien or not, um, had now been moved to some other location and we may never find them again. There might have been reason 40 years ago to believe that people couldn't handle uh, the idea of alien visitation. I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, I think we're far more sophisticated now. Do you regret having screwed up at S4 and taking your friends there and blowing your security cover because you could still be working on UFOs today? Uh, yes and no. Yes, I, at times I'd like to uh, be able to go back in time and and play along with the game and not have done anything and, and perhaps to this day still be working on them because I did feel privileged and it was fascinating work once you can get around all the uh, you know oppressive military security uh, and you know maybe we would have stumbled on something and uh, yeah, it would have been fascinating. I thought UFOs were a, pretty much a figment of someone's imagination. I didn't believe in them. Uh, I wasn't interested in them. Of course, I'm not even interested in them now. Um, but uh, I certainly do believe in them now.